to give a little bit of where I came from, how I got involved. Um, for those who don't know, I started a company called Games Workshop. Um, this is this really handsome guy on, the, on this side, that's me, in 1975. Um, we started with two school friends and we launched um, Dungeons & Dragons in the UK and uh, formed this company called Games Workshop. Of course, I'm from the Steam Age, which is the analog world, pre-computing, and um, went on to create interactive literature. I don't know if anyone's ever read these interactive books I used to write in my youth. <laughs> I remember them. Uh, they were kind of a predecessor to computer games that they are today. Uh, interactive books where the reader makes choices and goes through the books and hopefully comes out as a winner. Uh, I got involved in to video games in 1984 when I wrote Delmont's first game called Eureka. Um, Delmont was a small UK developer and publisher which metamorphosed into IDOS in 1995 when we put four companies together and um, created uh, the new interactive entity called IDOS. Of course, our, our biggest um, success was Tomb Raider in 1996. Um, and this is old bloke with Lara Croft. <laughs> <laughs> and I also do, kind of, today, uh, quite a lot of investment in, in young startup companies because the new independent um, developers now have got a, kind of, a fantastic opportunity to reach global audiences via, via high-speed broadband. Um, so where are we with video games? Well, basically anyone can play video games these mm. days. And it's new, moved from a sort of niche to a, to a mainstream market. You know, children play games, uh, young people play games, old people play games. Everybody's yeah. playing games these days. Uh, perception's always been reality and, and Games have had a bit of a tough time media-wise because if you look at a, a child reading a book, you think nice things, positive things, that they're doing something very constructive with their lives. You see them with a control in the hand, the, the media perception has always been quite negative. Uh, they've never talked about the positives about games, that they're puzzle-solving, problem-solving, intuitive learning, choice and consequence, um, learning about computing in a sort of basic way, and at least learning about manual dexterity, and some games are very active, not passive. Uh, and the fact that they are interactive is that they, the, the user is engaged uh, fully as opposed to linear entertainment which just kind of washes over you where you may, you're not usually engaged. So for me games are a very positive thing and, and, and people talk, I think people who criticise games are becoming marginalised now. Um, it's, for example, if you've never ever watched a movie in your life and you went to see Texas Ch Chainsaw Massacre and Saw and were asked to write about the film industry, you'd write some pretty negative Thing. So the, the media's always highlighted a few, one or two uh, negative titles um, and written this sort of shock horror uh, <laughs> headlines about them, rather than talking about the broad church of, of games. And we also have a, a very robust pan-European rating system called PEGI, where games are, are, are rated for users and, and specifically their parents to make sure that their children don't see any uh, untoward games. Said that only 3% by volume and 5% by value are actually rated as 18 games. So, brief history of video games where do they come from? Um, they really started in 1961 uh, with uh, a game uh, by Steve Russell. It was a laboratory experiment, just in his lab, two um, spaceships um, doing battle in space with limited fuel, limited missiles, but it was never actually uh, commercialized. It wasn't until the 70s uh, with Pong, it all looks very dated now, but the one thing about Pong is that it set a precedent for something that became lost over time. That this game was very, very easy to understand. There were six words to, to understand how they were played, avoid missing ball for high score, and you could start playing. And it had replay value, was played more and more and more and more again. So Pong got, got established, um, games entered the homes in, in the US, with the, the Magnavox Odyssey. This was the first game that plugged into a TV, although Magnavox made a bit of a marketing error by implying that you needed to plug into a Magnavox TV, um, which was obviously a mistake, I already had one, so it was a bit of a disaster. Plus, it was only one game one available on that machine, so it was a kind of large investment. Again, it was Atari in the 70s with the 2600, which made games more mass market in the USA, particularly because these games had uh, cartridges which you could plug into, into, the, into the console. Um, the Japanese
Japanese, never to be outdone, um, they jumped on the, on the bandwagon and as they always do, they improve concepts and, and iterate and make things very exciting. Uh, they dominated the, the arcades of the 70s, um, particular Space Invaders and Asteroids. In fact, in the late 70s when Space Invaders was launched, there was actually a shortage of 100 yen coins uh, because they were all stick, stuck in these machines and the, the Japanese meant had to do a, an emergency rent of 100 yen coins. So I'm just going to take you a little bit down memory lane now before we start talking about the serious issues of skills by this, the, kind of the early days of 